Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Towns, and I'm the Campaign Marketing Manager here at eLearning Brothers. Today, we're going to be talking about interactivity and accessibility. It's a very exciting topic, and uh, I think you guys are going to learn a lot. The session will be recorded. We will email a copy of the session out to everybody who has registered, so you'll be able to view that after the fact, as well as share it around with those who you think may benefit from it. If you have questions during the webinar, we will be using the questions panel. That's part of the GoToWebinar interface there. So send in any of your comments and questions through the one labeled questions, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. If there's some that we would like to answer but we can't due to time or the depth of the question, we will try to reach out and answer that offline. If you have not already, please feel free to check out our community, the Rockstars community. There's all kinds of really cool and exciting things there. We'll post a link to that in the chat that you can click on and check it out. There's a whole section about accessibility. We have entire sections on uh, other e-learning topics as well. We also cover e-learning tools from e-learning, uh, sorry, Lectora, uh, Scenario VR, uh, to the other tools like iSpring or PowerPoint or Articulate Storyline or Captivate. So it's a great place to go and have e-learning conversations and uh, find other people that are doing the same things that you're doing. All right, so we have fantastic guests with us today. We have Susie Miller, the, uh, she's an accessibility author and founder of Ella Hub LTD, as well as Chris Willis, director of product for Lectora. Thank you both for joining us. We're excited to hear what you have to share. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you, Susie. Brilliant. Great, Andrew, thanks for a lovely introduction. So what we're going to do is start our webinar by having a look at the agenda and looking at exactly what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to begin with an exploration of accessibility and interactivity in learning, which will allow us to clarify exactly what we mean by these two terms. And we're also going to look at a case study to help us unpick them a little bit more. Chris is then going to give you three strategies for inclusive um, interactions, and then we'll come back to me and I'll finish by leaving you with five key points. So really some key takeaways, which you can hopefully make, will hopefully make it easier for you to design accessible interactions moving forward. So as I mentioned, we're going to start the webinar by focusing on our definition. So what we actually mean by accessibility and interactivity in learning. But before we delve deeper, I think it's important just to explore both of those terms uh, just in some more depth. So we're going to start by having a look at a definition of accessibility. I'll just read this for you. Accessibility means that people can equally perceive, understand, navigate and interact with content. It also means they can contribute equally without barriers. So this explanation is based on a definition from the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. And it's one of the best definitions I have found because it focuses on this idea of an equal experience for everyone. And really interestingly, notice that that actually includes interacting with content. So I think it's also really effective because it introduces the idea of accessible learning being barrier free. And maybe it gets us to start thinking that actually as e-learning practitioners, we can be responsible for creating barriers if we don't make our learning um, accessible. So being clear about what accessibility means is a great starting point. But how can we be sure that our learning is accessible and barrier free for our disabled learners? So the most rec reliable, really, and internationally recognized way that we can be sure is to meet the web content, W3C Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. Now, although the version of WCAG varies from country to country, depending on legislation, so for example, in the US, Section 508 is aligned to WCAG 2.0, it's increasingly WCAG 2.1, Levels A and AA, which are considered, be, be, considered to be the benchmark for accessibility. So that means really is e-learning um, practitioners that there are 50 guidelines that we need to, to meet to be sure that our, our learning is, is accessible. So although these guidelines are important and we are, they will underpin our exploration of accessibility moving on in the webinar, they're not going to be our main focus. So I'm not going to start, as some of you might be expecting, by explaining the definitions of the four WCAG principles. So I'm sure you're familiar with those perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. And the reason I'm not going to do that is because I actually believe that it's often the technical language and the complexity of the WCAG guidelines, which is partly to blame 
why uh, partly to blame for why so many people are wary of engaging with accessibility so instead of starting off with a deep dive into the WCAG we're going to turn our focus to another industry to find out what we can learn about accessibility and interactivity now to do that I'm going to show you here on the screen a screenshot of it's quite a famous clip in the accessibility community and it shows a man who's overcome with emotion so I just wondered if anyone knows who the man is and what he's reacting to if you do know then please could you let us know in the chat and Andrew can uh, can share that with us I'll give you guys a couple moments to type or to think and then type so what, what could he be reacting to? And do you have any idea who he is? A conundrum to start. <laughs> a lot of uh, nopes, I don't know. Uh, one person <laughs> says a blind gamer. Yes, he is. Well done, brilliant. Someone Excellent. says he's reacting to The Last of Us Part Two's accessibility. Well done. Yeah, absolutely brilliant, fantastic, perfect. So yes, his name is Steve Saylor and he's he's known as the Blind Gamer and he's a champion of accessible gaming. And the screenshot is from a recording of his reaction when he saw the accessibility features exactly um, as, as whoever responded there brilliantly said um, to a, a video game, which is The Last of Us Part Two. And this game has over 60 accessibility features and at the moment is recognized to be the most <laughs> accessible game that's ever been made. Now, I think this is a fantastic way to start our exploration of accessibility and interactivity for two reasons. Firstly, because it focuses on the human aspect of accessibility and the fact that it can have such profound impacts on the experience of our users. And secondly, because it makes us challenge the assumption that interactivity cannot be accessible. So as an e-learning consultant, this is without the, without the doubt the most common thing I hear from clients, the most common sort of concern that they have is that um, accessible learning can't be interactive. So while the authoring tools that we use may not necessarily allow us to make our learning as accessible as maybe the, the Last of Us Part 2, there are still many things that we can do to make, uh, to make sure that we include people with a range of disabilities in our interactive content. So in a moment, we're going to have a look at a case study to explore this in more detail. But before we do, we just need to return to our definitions because we haven't clarified yet exactly what we mean by interactivity. And that's thinking of interactive specifically in, in, an e, in a learning context as opposed to maybe a gaming or a standard website context so slightly different meaning maybe for us in our context <clears throat> so in its strictest sense when we talk about inter interactivity we really mean anything that learners can physically interact with in the learning content and in a book I've written recently about accessible learning content designing accessible learning content I've created a framework which breaks down and um, the WCAG and divides them into groups which are relevant for different e-learning contexts and I cover interactivity in step three so in that step I subdivide interactive items you might be able to see on the screen here the little icons that I have here so I subdivide those interactive items into three categories so I start with navigation items input items and links so really we're thinking about our learners ability to do things like uh, recognize and interact with with these um, these items so it could be for example navigating the e-learning resource selecting buttons answering quiz questions following links etc so we know that it's essential for our learners to be able to recognize and interact with these items regardless of their disability or impairment. But it's also important to be aware that in a learning content, interactivity actually means more than that. So if you want interactivity be, to be fully effective in our learning content, we need to move beyond this narrow def definition and really think of it as also being something which engages our learners. So kind of a cognitive process really, which helps them to successfully assimilate the learning objectives or adopt the behaviors that we're trying to achieve in our learning outcomes. So the question really is, is it possible to achieve this? So it was well that they, uh, they can recognize and interact, but also, that they can also that there's this cognitive engagement so that's what we're going to look at now so is it possible to achieve this and still make learning accessible for everyone 
To find out, we're going to explore a real world case study. And this is of a health and safety um, onboarding module that I designed and developed for a UK university. I find this approach with working with a, with a, with a real example is really helpful in training because it kind of focuses on a, a concrete learning need. So, but it also helps us to make accessibility come alive. To begin with then, I'm going to focus on the learning need for the project. And hopefully while I'm giving you the, the background, it may start you thinking about how you might have tackled this particular project. So the purpose of the course was to keep international students um, new to the UK and also the university environment safe and also well in their new surroundings. So the target audience was a group of pre-sessional students, so aged between about 18 to 25, most of them were about 19, 20, and a key factor in the learning was that it needed to be at an appropriate level of English so all of the students were coming on the course taking part in the program to improve their English level before they they started their full university course and you can see on the screen that the stakeholder requirements were that the learning intervention it should be interactive and engaging and if possible also have an element of gamif gamification so that was a, a really popular buzzword at the time so among the topics that you would imagine I needed to cover, such as road safety and keeping healthy, keeping well, I was also asked to tackle the topic of recycling. Now, really interesting because this was actually because differences in attitudes to recycling had actually caused some tension between international students and local students in the past. So my solution for this topic needed to make sure that the pre-sessional students knew or understood that recycling was really a, an expectation in their new environment. And also they needed to be aware of the, of the many different types of recycling bins that we had on the campus and also in their halls of residence and also what needed to go into each bin. So what you may have noticed about the requirements is that actually accessibility wasn't one of them. And this was because the project was initiated before public sector regulations in the UK meant that the content needed to be accessible to WCAG 2.1 AA standards. So as a result, the first, section, uh, the first solution I designed, um, it was interactive, but it actually wasn't accessible. In a moment, I'm going to play you a video clip of my solution, and I'd like you to identify as many different ways as you can that the content actually isn't accessible. But before we do that, I think it's really helpful just to remind ourselves of the types of disability we need to be aware of when we're talking about a digital context. Now, my reason for doing this is because along with the technical complexity of WCAG, I think it's sometimes a lack of understanding about different types of disability and how to accommodate them, which again leads to, co to confusion and misconceptions about accessibility and learning content. So although we don't have time to go into a lot of detail now, I'll just give you a quick overview of the four categories we divide disability into from a digital perspective, and then give you a few examples, which are kind of the common ones that people often mention on training. So I'll start with the visual, probably the, the most, the one that people think most um, frequently when you talk about accessibility is, is the visual category. So it could be, for example, blindness, low vision, colour blindness that we need to be aware of, and some specific examples that sometimes come up, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, for example, they are all causing different um, kind of aspects of, of, of visual impairment. Then we have hearing, um, deafness, hard being hard of hearing, hearing loss could be caused by acoustic trauma. Another um, example is auditory processing um, disorder. Now the motor impairment one is really interesting from a digital accessibility point of view because you can see the icon there with the, the little mouse is really just an indicator that what we're thinking of from a digital accessibility um, point of view is actually something that impairs someone's ability to um, interact with hardware. So it's actually a manual dexterity issue. So for example, we could have loss or damage of limbs, arthritis, arthritis, multiple sclerosis, um, RSI, Parkinson's, cerebral palsy, all of those things can interact someone's motor ability when they're, when they're um, working with or when they're interacting with digital, with, with digital content. Finally, we have cognitive, which is probably the, the sort of the broadest area. 
And that can include many things that affect cognitive abilities. It could be learning difficulties, for example, Down syndrome, neurodiverse conditions such as dyslexia, ADHD, and also even mental health issues, which are, um, you know, which can affect anxiety. So all of those can affect someone's ability to interact with our content. So hopefully that's a, a good starting point to, to, to make you think about the types of, of um, basically the types of impairments or disability that we need to be aware of. So I'm going to start by playing you a video of my solution. And when I play this video, I'd just like you, as I say, to add any issues that you identify into the chat. And if possible, let me know whether they would be a problem for people with visual, hearing or motor or co motor or cognitive impairments. Before I play the video, just to let you know, it actually has no sound. The game I designed had a warning siren which sounded uh, when learners had five seconds to complete the task, but I've muted that for this demonstration in case it's quite loud, it used to startle people. So it's actually muted, so don't worry about that. So I'll play it now, and as I say, if you could put anything that you can think of in the chat, that would be great. So Andrew, is there anything you can start feeding back on now? Is it possible or? Yep, so no transcription of the closed captions. Uh, there's yep. clicking required on the button. Um, there's what, sorry? The, the button requires clicking, or the, yep. you know, they, they did click yep. on the button. Yep. With, someone says with the sound, you should be able to control uh, that, I think, so the warning sound would be one. Yeah, perfect. Um, Visual will not know where or when to click. There's some colorblind yep. potential issues here, poor contrast. There's text on images. Yeah. Um, drag and drop doesn't work, says another person. There's a timing issue that doesn't seem to work. Um, Great. Too much movement on the slide may disturb people with visual processing issues. Brilliant. So some some really excellent uh, feedback there. Great and 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 absolutely right. Yes. So completely uh, lots of accessibility issues that we need to look at in more detail. So what we'll do is sorry, I just skip from there. Um, as I say, what we'll do is we'll look in specifically at the WCAG issues that, that uh, we, people have identified. But before we do that, I just wanted to share a key takeaway, which I've actually found what, what I would call transform transformational, both in my own accessibility practice and in the training that I deliver. And that is, just skip those slides, the key, a key takeaway is moving the focus away from impairments and focusing instead on real people when we're considering access needs. So instead of just thinking about our icons and our list of examples, it's really important, I think, to consider real people. So the examples I use in my training are all people and they all have a video presence. So I found this incredibly helpful because it moves accessibility away from the abstract and allows everyone to get a better understanding of how disabled people use assistive technology, that's a key thing, and also the barriers that we can create with our digital learning. So let's find out now how my solution um, created barriers for some of those learners. And although, as I say, there's some really great feedback there, what we'll do is focus specifically on the ones which are our WCAG violations. So we'll start with Mark, and he's a blind screen reader user. And as many of you identified, my game is inaccessible for someone like Mark because he's a non-visual learner and he won't be able to see or operate the drag and drop interaction. Although his screen reader may be able to read out the items on the page, because he navigates using the keyboard and keyboard shortcuts, he won't actually be able to drag the items into the bins and, and using the drag and drop interaction. And that's actually a violation of WCAG 2.0. 1.1, which is um, keyboard. Another violation of this standard applies to Emma, and she has Parkinson's disease, which makes her hands tremor. And in Emma's case, she doesn't have the motor controls needed to control a mouse. So although there are many forms of assistive technology that she can use, one of the most common is to use a keyboard to navigate. 
And my recycling game again would be inaccessible for Emma because she uses a keyboard to interact with content. She won't be able again to use the draw, drag and drop interactivity. But the crucial distinction between Mark and Emma is that although they both use the keyboard to interact, Emma is a visual learner where Mark is non-visual, and we'll talk about that in a, uh, in a bit more in a bit more detail later. So my game, someone um, pointed this one out as well, my game also prevented Antoine from having an equivalent learning experience to other people because it communicated information which relied only on one sense, so thinking of that warning um, signal. So that warning sound I included to tell learners they only had five seconds left um, only relied on sound. So as a result, I excluded Antoine, who would have needed another way of communicating that information which didn't rely only on his sense of hearing. And finally, there were some issues again, which people um, picked up on, which was great. Some issues in my game, which would have had an impact on the learning experience of Daniel, who's on the autistic spectrum and also ha who has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So the first was the split spinning globe in the introduction of the game. And this is a work violation because the movement starts automatically. It potentially lasts for longer than five seconds and it, ca it can't be controlled by the learner. So this could make it really difficult or even impossible for Dan to process the information on that initial slide because it can be distracting going on in the background. And this is a, a violation of the appropriately, appropriately named um, pause, stop and hide standard. And the countdown clock is another issue actually. That could also be a problem because it continually moves in the game and it could also be an unwelcome distraction. So another issue with that countdown clock uh, for Dan and many other learners is that it can't be controlled. And this means that there's a fixed amount of time that learners have to complete the interaction, which again is a, is a violation. And that is of WCAG 2.2.1, which is timing adjustable. So uh, pretty clear really that I needed to go back to the drawing board when it came to making my interactivity accessible. Although it, it, initially it felt like a, an incredibly daunting task to find a solution which was both interactive and accessible, it really made me explore what I was trying to achieve from the learning and how my solution uh, effectively solved the learning need that I had at the beginning, if you think back to that, that, that slide when we looked at the need. So I decided that the drag and drop content was actually key to the interaction because I wanted to replicate as closely as I could the action of putting items into different bins. And the language constraint meant that using images of items and photographs of real recycling bins was, was really the most effective way of conveying this information. And this brings us back to the idea of interactivity in, in learning. So I wanted to use the drag, drag and drop interaction, not just for the sake of it, not, not just because it was an interactivity, but actually because it reinforced the behavior change, which was the purpose of the learning invention. So to solve that issue, I started by finding out about the accessibility functionality of the tool that I was using, which again is, is, is the best place to start when you're trying to think of how to make your um, accessibility, sorry, your interactivity accessible. And I, I realized that in my particular tool that I was using, that the multiple response um, quiz question was both um, accessible for keyboard only and also for screen reader users. So I decided to use that and then I adapted it by um, using motion paths to mimic a drag and drop interactivity. So for the other issues that we talked about, the solution was really much more straightforward. So I realized that the spinning globe was just for decoration, so I just lost the animation. The warning sound, I have to admit, was really just a gimmick. And, it, and we, we, as we said, it could potentially startle and be a distraction for, for quite a lot of learners. So I just lost the alarm. I decided the countdown clock was, was also a distraction and I removed it. But an alternative option I could have come up with is maybe just to give learners the ability to extend the amount of time they had or to switch it off completely. So is that that, that kind of where you have you know options that you can decide what what is best in that case I actually thought well it, it, I found it quite I do find um, movement quite a distraction so I decided that I'd lose that countdown clock so what I'll do now is just play you two short clips of my second solution to show you how they were both accessible and interactive and I'll start with one which shows the inter how the interaction works uh, for a keyboard uh, keyboard only user so I'll play this clip now 
If you aren't familiar with keyboard interaction, the video shows me interacting using the tab key and I'm jumping from one interactive item to the next and the end key I'm using to select my options. The yellow outline you can see around each interactive item is called what we call the visible focus indicator and this is automatically quite often provided in the functionality of the tool. In the tool that I was using, this is always a yellow box, but one of the features that I love in Lectora is that you can change the color and weight of the focus indicator to make it easier for visual learners to see. So the key takeaway really from keyboard accessibility, if you're not familiar with it, is that it's to remember that although keyboard only users interact with content using the keyboard, they're still visual learners. So they still will be able to see the interactions that you create. And this challenges another a common accessibility misconception, which is that accessible content doesn't need to be visually engaging. So yeah, hopefully you found that useful. And what we'll do now is I will ask Andrew in a moment to play the final short um, video clip. So the reason that Andrew needs to play this is so you can hear what's going on. So it's actually a video clip of the NVDA screen reader um, voicing an access the accessible interaction. And it's something that, again, it's almost one of these transformational things that I think is really helpful when you're finding out more about e-learning accessibility. Now, although I'm only a really very basic screen reader user, I think you can learn a huge amount just from getting an idea of how a screen reader interacts with your content. So I always advise my delegates to download the free NVDA screen reader and to become familiar with some of the basic commands. It's a real eye opener, I think, when you see how, how um, a, a screen reader actually interacts with content. So Andrew, I don't know if you could play the clip now. Yep, here we go. We said we just need a minute or so really, just so people can have. Okay. Helping save the planet. Slide one of seven. We're working to reduce the waste we produce and to recycle as much as we can at our halls of residence and on campus. This topic will tell you how you can help. Button find out more. Helping save the planet. Slide 2 of 7. Recycling at your halls of residence. Which rubbish should go into the food bin? Use the space bar to select your options and then select. Submit to check your answers. Check box not checked Apple Core. Checked. Checked. Check box not checked Onion Peel. Checked. Check box not checked Pizza Box. Check box not checked Empty Tin. Check box not checked use tea bag. Checked. Checked. Button submit. Well done. That's the correct answer. The apple core, onion peel, and used tea bag go into the food bin. Excellent. So I hope, I hope you found that helpful, um, especially if you've never heard a screen reader reading learning content before. So um, that kind of brings us to the end of this case study. And um, I hope it's helped to show how it is possible. I know it's only one example, but for me, it's a real key one, which really showed me that, you know, it helped to unpick all of these ideas of interactivity and accessibility. And it shows you how it is possible to make e-learning both accessible, interactive. And also I think about how thinking about the needs of all our learners actually made my second solution, I think, a better learning experience than the first. And to prove that, I just wanted to share that the final version of this module, which was accessible, was shortlisted for the best nonprofit and public sector project in the Learning Technologies Award. So I'm not saying that to show off. I'm just saying that to prove that it is possible to be both interactive and accessible. So now I'll hand over to Chris and she's going to show us some more examples of accessible interactions. Thanks, Susie. Um, I think Andrew is going to hand me the screen. Here we go. And wait a minute, what am I showing here? Oh, we see your presenter notes. I'll pass it to you again. Can you do that, please? I clicked on it thinking that it was going to give me an option of what to show. Show my screen. Oh, I got to do the drop down here. Okay, let's see. Screen of monitor two. There we go. There we Looks go. great. 
Okay, super. So yeah, one of the things uh, when Susie was playing the screen reader too, you will find that um, most of the screen reader users that I've heard or watched them too, they play at like double, quadruple speed. They, uh, some of them, you can, you can go on YouTube and look for some demos of um, folks who are actual screen reader users and they will show you what their experience is like. And it is incredible if you think of your fastest, fastest speed reading, but then they they read, you know, to me, it just sounds like, like uh, uh, just, but they hear it and they decode it. So um, that's one of the things that's really interesting when you hear, uh, a lot of times you'll hear people say something about, well, we have to include narrated audio for folks that um, uh, are unable to read. Our text they don't want to it's painfully slow for them they would much rather that we make our course work with the adaptive technology that they are used to using and and that works for them so um okay some accessible interactions i am let's see if we can make this work oh let's see Let's try that. Okay, I'm gonna talk about three principles that will help you when you're thinking about creating interactive learning. And I wanna give you some starting places here. Um, Susie did a really excellent job of, of deconstructing something that she had done that had been a drag and drop. And she actually um, also did a really great job of demonstrating these three principles. So um, when I show these, and then I'm going to be talking a little bit about them in regards to Lectora, because this is eLearning Brothers, and Lectora is the product that I work with every day. However, these are things that you can use with any uh, eLearning development tool. Uh, even somebody mentioned earlier PowerPoint. And, and if you're using PowerPoint, you can use these principles. So let's take a look at what we've got here. For the first one, I'm going to talk about creating speed bumps. And what I mean by speed bumps is breaking down walls of words and chunking your information appropriately. Information design using bite-sized pieces and setting the context. Now I'll show that, that'll make a little more sense in the demo that I'm gonna show you in a minute. But um, a lot of times when we're developing interactive learning, we'll have these models that we'll use and we'll say, well, let's put a click to reveal there. And why are we doing that? We're doing it because we're told that every X number of slides, we have to make something interactive. And so we go to our box of tricks and we pull out whatever our tool does and we, we chunk up the information. I would challenge you to think about it a little more purposefully and think about of the information you have, what do you have that is maybe something longer that is comprised of smaller parts? And then how can you set the context for what you're about to present and use that interaction to break that up in a meaningful way that actually helps improve the learning as opposed to just doing it for the sake of interactivity. And that's what I mean about speed bumps, slow it down, chunk it up, use appropriate headings, and give people an opportunity to digest what you're chunking up and giving them to them. So there's the first principle. The second one that I'm gonna show you in the demo is how to engage with words. Ask any avid reader, and they will tell you that words themselves have great power to engage your heart and mind. And when you are reading, and you're reading something that's very compelling, that's beautifully written, or that's written with, uh, that, that uh, triggers action or thinking, what you're doing is creating the interactivity that happens here, not the interactivity that happens here. And that's really what we want in learning, is to interact with our learners uh, with their brains and to fire those synapses and to get them thinking about and reflecting on what it is we're training. 
So that's what I want you to think about is engaging with words. And then the third principle that we're going to demonstrate, well, actually, wait, before we get there, sorry about that. Before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about this. This is kind of fun. When I'm talking about engaging with words, one of the things that, uh, how many folks out there, have you ever played with one of these interaction, interactive fiction games, maybe back in the day? Um, and these games are pure text. There's uh, their text-based adventure games, uh, IF, interaction, interactive fiction. It's a classic genre. All the interaction takes place on your screen with words. And these kind of games are still alive. There's a whole group here um, at, at the uh, URL at the bottom of my screen, pr-if.org slash play. You can go in and actually play some of these games. And I would encourage you to do it because if you're writing e-learning scenarios, you're going to find some uh, ways that they use setup and uh, creative writing to really engage you with the action that they're presenting and the story that they're telling. Years ago, my friends Bill and Kit Horton presented an example of a text, totally completely text-based learning game that was done in this kind of format. And when they polled the learners who had taken the game afterwards, oh, they asked them, what did you like the most about it? And many of the learners responded, I liked it that it was interactive. And it was pure words, nothing but words. So if I can, I'm going to go ahead and try and bring my example over here and see is this, if this works. Are you seeing this on the screen, Andrew? Yep, looks great. Super. Somebody's real stressed on that screen. Somebody is really stressed. So. What I did was uh, kind of like in, in the same spirit of what Susie did. I went back to one of our um, games. This is or one of our courses. This was actually from our professional soft soft skills series uh, at eLearning Brothers from our courseware, and I took our stress management course and. Uh, Broke that down and saw what I challenged myself. What can I do to make that more um, accessible? So I look at as the first example I just looked at. So here we have a text block, and it's like, and this is certainly accessible. I can present this. This can be read. Um, Lectora, when you create a course in Lectora, it's very easy to um, set up a course that, that is screen reader friendly. That's one of the things that Lector does really, really well. And so this is, this is perfectly fine. And I could present this topic in this way. But if I wanted to make this topic both accessible and interactive, I can create some speed bumps and chunk this up and ask the question, how does stress affect your mood? And then now let's break it down. And instead of having just that big paragraph reading each item, let's think about each one individually. Let's think about the mental health impact of stress. How does stress affect my motivation? How does stress affect the quality of my work? How does stress affect my mood? So that's the exact same block of information, but I've now used chunking. I've set the context for what I'm about to read. And now I've also broken it down into four important topics. And then in the actual course, what happened next was we went through then and we expounded on each one of the four topics. So I actually could use this as kind of a way marker as well to go through each one as it presented the course. And yes, I recognize, I, apologies, I am using my mouse. But <laughs> OK, acute stress comes on suddenly. Chronic stress is experienced over a longer period of time. And then I, I did break down a, a game here. This is uh, very similar to 
um, instead of doing a drag and drop, which we originally had in the course, and had it set up which ones, uh, which stress triggers were uh, acute, tri acute stress, which ones were um, chronic stress. It's not necessary to drag those in this case. There's no um, behavior that we're trying to reinforce that has to do with that moving anything from one place to the other. What we really want to do is identify that we recognize the concept of chronic stress versus um, acute stress. So let's see, if we're looking at chronic stress, something that happens over a long time, that could be a tight deadline. No, that's something that happens. Uh, well, I suppose it could be. That could have been chronic stress. But if it's a tight deadline, it's probably happening to you right now. A family illness can be something that happens. Presenting a webinar, that is definitely acute stress, especially when you're trying to get your demo ready for your <laughs> webinar the day of or the minute of. <laughs> Growing debt and loss of a loved one. We'll put that one in, submit, okay. But this is the one that I really am excited to show you. And this is where um, we took, I took the, um, I, I created a story that talks about the different kinds of stress and um, I put it into action. And I kind of thought about this, how could I use Lectora in a way that, um, how could I use the things that are built into Lectora and use the words to create the picture and create the interaction? So I set up this game where you are uh, hiking on a mountain adventure and we give you the instructions here. As you make your choices, each you're going to present a small scenario, and as you make your choices, you're going to have three options. One option will reduce your stress points by 10, one that will not alter, it's neutral, and one will raise your stress level by 10 points. So we go through a set of five questions, sets up the scenario. We'll just read through the first one. You've been climbing for a while. You've gained significant elevation. You can't pinpoint exactly why, but you can't shake this feeling that something isn't quite right. Your muscles tense, your tension rises. As you begin to wonder, maybe you veered off your planned trail. What do you do next? And for the sake of time, I'd, I'd love to ask you and play this through with you, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, select one of the one of these answers. I'll just say we'll push, push harder so we can reach the summit faster. Um, we keep trekking upwards, thinking we'll soon clear the tree line. The more you walk, the more stressed you get. You stop and reach for your smartphone in frustration. That adds 10 stress points. And we'll go through just really quickly. I'll, I'll uh, shout some profanity that would make a sailor proud because I found I just lost my cell phone, which is really not good. My hissy fit made me feel better, but I wasted a lot of time, so I didn't get any points for that. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to ignore my body signals, and that's not very good. That's uh, also giving me more stress. Now I found a marked trail. I, I think I'll just trust that I can keep going. Eh, that was maybe not the best of the three answers. And we'll do one more here. There's five total. All right. And then there is how my results appear on my stress meter. Now, of course, for the interactive course, then if this was a screen reader, it would need to read your results out to you where you uh, appeared on the meter. So then you can replay and try and beat your score. Let's see. The last of the uh, three The last of my three um, examples is to hack your authoring tool. Um, again, what we want to do is get into the idea that not every quiz, 
not everything that's in your authoring tool needs to be used the way that they describe it in your authoring tool. A quiz question is more than just a quiz question. It's an opportunity to exploit your authoring tool to create some form of interactivity. A survey isn't just a survey, it's the same thing. So anything that you can use in your authoring tool to get you to reflect that can add gamification, like in the previous example, that was just a multiple choice scored uh, quiz that was set up, but the words, we use the words to make it gamified and make it interactive. The minute you ask the question, you are interacting with your learner because your learner is engaging with their brain to try and uh, figure out the answer. So it is the asking of the question of it itself that creates interactivity. And just really quick, within Lectora, we have a lot of these kind of options. We've got the uh, standard uh, question types, a true, false, multiple choice, ranking, sequencing, putting things in order, which can be an alternative for sorting in a drag and drop, uh, numbered entry. Um, you can uh, use the matching, although the matching takes a lot of time to do with the keyboard, so use that very sparingly and only when it makes sense to use that. And then your uh, short answers, essays, and fill in the blanks. Those are very difficult to score, but again, from the standpoint of do you really need to score them, sometimes asking the question and getting the learner the opportunity to reflect is more important than what they actually type in the box. So the actual, uh, these kinds of questions, short answers, essays, fill in the blanks, um, they're not only compliant, but they can be uh, really useful in engaging your learner's uh, brain and creating uh, an opportunity for them to interact with the material that you are presenting. So that is the end of my demo. And uh, that concludes what I have to show. So now I'm going to turn it back to Susie. Uh, Susie, you can bring us home. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. That was really interesting, Chris. Excellent. So uh, what we're going to do is just uh, finish this webinar, just focusing on on five key takeaways, which we we think will we just want to draw out of the learning from um, from our from our learning today. So they're basically five key things which we we've learned over many years designing accessible learning interactions and also helping our clients to do the same. So the first one is really this idea that accessibility equals innovation, not limitation. We tend to have this think this idea that, that accessibility means that we're limited, that we can't do what we want to do. And I think that, that we think that's, that's not the case. We think accessibility just makes you think differently. It gives you the potential to stop designing things using your own biases and, and really we believe that it, it leads to innovation and better learning. And kind of along along the same um, idea as that is this idea of unlearning and relearning. And this takeaway comes from a quote by the writer um, Alvin Toffler. And that quote is that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. So we believe passionately that, that learning about accessibility makes you a better designer because it challenges you to kind of unlearn and then relearn everything you thought you knew about designing effective learning content. And that idea of relearning is a key idea too when it comes to accessibility because it's really important to remember that accessibility is, is a journey and not a destination. So there's always more to learn about accessibility. And one point that, that you know we really want to emphasize is, is don't be afraid of making mistakes. I think for me that was one of the key things that used to really hold me back when I was thinking about accessibility was I was just frightened of, of making the mistakes and I've definitely made all of the mistakes in my own accessibility journey but just that idea that it, it is something that, that you learn about more. You know, Every time you work with a new client, every new project, you learn more about accessibility. Every time you find out a little bit more about assistive technology uh, or you, know, you have the opportunity to work with someone with a lived experience 
experience of a disability is just so interesting and, and you know such a you know such a, a a privilege really to learn more and more about accessibility and it really does make you um, a better learning designer so another key thing is this idea that collaboration is the key so one of the key things which helped me in my own accessibility journey again was was collaboration so a great example for me was trying to work out how i could make that drag and drop interaction accessible and i, I just could not think how i could do it so i turned to my to the community that that for, for the authoring tool that i was using at the time and i just adapted a solution that someone else had kindly shared so it's really important i think to 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 you know to rely on other people and the information and the experience that they have and I know that Lectora has a really active Lectora accessibility user group and that's a fantastic network to turn to for accessibility support so if you're if you're especially if you're worried about making mistakes it's really great to have the support of other people in the community to to help you along um, the fourth takeaway brings us back to the WCAG really and uh, what I certainly found myself is that once you make sense of the WCAG and you learn how to apply them to a learning context they can actually be hugely helpful in giving you the practical guidance you need to make learning content accessible. They don't need to be a hindrance, they, they should be more of a help. But in my own experience, again, it was the fact that I found it so difficult and daunting and, and time consuming to really understand how they apply to learning content. And I couldn't really find much help to support me when I was doing it. And that's what really pr prompted me to write my book. Uh, which is uh, that book that we talked about before, the Designing Accessible Learning Content. So it's due to be published in June, and I really hope it makes it much easier for other e-learning professionals just using a different, a whole variety of different tools to make their content accessible to WCAG standards in the future. What it does is it kind of decodes them, puts them into plain English, and puts them into an e-learning context with uh, as many different authoring tool examples as I could find of best practice, et cetera, to, to, to really help people to apply them to learning rather than the standard kind of website um, and programming that they tend to be associated with. So my final and probably the most important key takeaway comes back to this idea that accessibility really only makes sense if you consider the people that it impacts. So if we design accessible learning content, sorry, if we design inaccessible learning content, then what we're doing is creating barriers which disable people's abilities and their potential to succeed. If we design accessible learning content, we allow everyone to participate equally. And that brings me to the final quote of our webinar today. And uh, it's a very famous quote, you may know it. it's by um, Steve Crew, the uh, user experience guru. And he famously said, the one argument for accessibility that doesn't get made nearly often enough is how extraordinarily better it makes some people's lives. How many opportunities do we have to dramatically improve people's lives just by doing our job a little better? And I think for me, that is a key takeaway. If ever I'm, I'm feeling disheartened or it's feeling too difficult, I always come back to that quote. And I think actually I do have the potential to really help people by making my learning content accessible. That's it. Do you want to take back the screen? Uh, no, I think you've got one more slide for me, Susie. And okay. uh, we have several questions here. Um, and we're going to dive into some of those questions. But before everybody jumps off, I also want to make sure you guys know where you can get Susie's book. So if we can go one more forward. Um, oh, one more. two more. The, there we well, go. That one. Yes. Uh, so I'm Make going sure to I know where that one is. <laughs> I'm going to put uh, a link to this, a clickable link in the chat, um, as well as the discount code. We're going to make sure we. So there's the chat uh, link, and then here's the discount code. So you guys can grab the book. Um, you said it's pre order now, right? Yeah. Due to be published in June, I think. Okay, fantastic. Um, also, we are uh, continuing this conversation in the community, so I'll put another link to the community in there as well if you guys would like to jump in there. Someone someone commented a, a nice, uh, they said, I hope you're, you're talking about the LAUG. Um, that, that is, that is a, a big one, so there's access to that inside the Rockstars community. You can also visit, uh, it's thelaug.org, right? 
just got to make sure I say that right. Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that you know about um, Lectora. Lectora is a great tool for making accessibility uh, stuff. So I've put that inside of the chat. All of those are now in the chat. And now we'll jump into questions. So uh, here we go. So are fill in the blank questions accessible if they need to type? Um, the fill in the blank questions that we have in Lectora actually have a drop down. So they will give you a uh, opportunity to have read to you and make a choice, just like um, in a way, it's kind of like a different form of a multiple choice in a way. But um, if you need to type, I need to think about that a minute. Um, I guess it would depend on how you would set up the question to be read to your learner using the reader. And so what I would encourage you to do with that one is, is try it. Um, your tool may or may not have something that's set up and it will give you guidelines for that. If they don't, then just try something and then experience it yourself and think, ask the question, would I want to take learning? this way does this actually help me learn or is this getting in the way of my learning and the whole point of being accessible is to make your learning easier to take to give you access to your learning so that's susie do you have anything to add to that or um i think again it's it's coming back to learning more so when you're thinking about it's impossible sometimes to know everything about assistive technology and how people will interact with it. I was just thinking about, you know, that you're thinking about in inputting. We tend to think of it, well, if it's a keyboard, then it might not be accessible. But then there's a lot of alternatives to keyboards, so keyboard interfaces. So, for example, you can have on screen keyboards and they can be operated, for example, with eye gaze technology. So. You know, it, it's difficult to say, yes, 100% that's going to be interactive, but I think it's it's that learning and, and finding out more about how people are using assistive technology. So I think my understanding, if something is, is keyboard accessible, there are alternatives that, that you can use. If someone can't physically use a keyboard, there, there are alternatives that they can use other inf interfaces, which then would come back to making that an accessible um, interaction. Fantastic. Uh, you mentioned a screen reader uh, there. Someone asked how many different screen readers are there? You suggested one, but how different do you typically find if I'm trying to find a screen reader to test uh, my course? Chris, do you want to take that one or do you want me to? Um, I, I will just say that when we're testing uh, for Lectora, we, we tend to use NVDA because it is uh, um, because it is free, it's it's freely available, and 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 we can do that. We also use um, the JAWS reader because that's a uh, very robust and and widely used reader. I don't know about the other ones. I do know that that there's those two. Um, I don't, and I don't know personally know a whole lot behind that. Our customer success and our testers would know more about that than I would. Um, Susie, do you have anything to add to that or? Yeah, so I think that the, 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 the two that you mentioned, Chris, are the, are the main ones that people do usually use for testing. And I think they are, um, I think it, um, it, research by WebAIM shows that they are the two most popular screen, reader, screen readers that, that, that people use. I think the NVDA one is becoming more popular. It's open source and it's free. I think the JAWS um, option is great. It has a, a, a you know great um, functionality. Unfortunately, it can be quite prohibitively expensive. So I think that's the reason lots of people don't use it. You can use it for testing. Um, it really should be only for non non commercial um, reasons and the, and the disadvantage from a, a testing point of view is that you have to restart your machine every 40 minutes so you know that that is something that that means but but the the functionality of jaws is is, is very good so the other thing i'd mention about if you do 
use your you know if you do use um if you do do testing is that also there is it's important to kind of make sure you're using the right browser because i think they can sometimes you know i think for example at the top of my head i think nvda works better with firefox and jaws works better i think with chrome with with chrome so i think if you it, it's if you're going to do um t testing which is is a really fantastic thing to do it's just worth doing a little bit of research into you know maybe the browsers that 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 you should be using etc because that will give you a better um, user experience than if you're using a different browser. Um, Andrew Townsend I can get you a link to a document that was done by one of our LAUG members that talks about how to test uh, using NVDA and it's very very good so um, yeah, we can get that out in the follow-up email later today. Follow-up email exactly. That'd be great. Um, we uh, we're we're just about out of time. I do want to ask this other question here. Uh, I use Storyline and I've been learning how to use focus order and the ability to turn on and off on-screen elements. My question is, do other authoring tools uh, have similar abilities? That is one of the great strengths of Lectora is that because when you use the Explorer in Lectora, you can actually see the order that things will be read and, and uh, you can very easily by m moving things around, uh, actually change that order yourself. So um, that is one of the great strengths of Lectora. I can't speak to that in other tools, um, but I do know that in, in ours, that's something that um, makes, accessible learning more accessible to author so excellent uh, I wish we could we could answer all these questions I will tell you this that Chris Willis is very active in the Rockstars community and there are plenty of places to talk about uh, accessibility there it's an entire category dedicated to it so please let's continue this conversation there just go to rockstars.elearningbrothers.com and Chris will hang out in there and she's happy to chat with you so uh, do that. Also, don't forget to uh, get the Designing Accessible Learning Content pre-order uh, for that book, uh, Susie's book. It'll be great. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Chris, for coming. This okay. has been very, very useful. Everybody had a great time. We all learned something new, and uh, we'll have to get you back again, Chris, Susie. This has just been fantastic. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for joining. Thank Bye. You. Bye.